Well, hello. Welcome to the lunchtime talk. So thank you for skipping some food or eating early. I appreciate that. This is uh, the final frontier, automating dynamic security testing with myself. And let's go to the next slide. Cody. Um, quickly about me. I'm a Defect Dojo core contributor. I also am a co-lead of the AppSec pipeline. I've been involved in OWASP for far too long, since 2008. That's not really far too long. I like the place. Um, I'm currently the Global Director of Security Evangelism for No Name Security. So if you have API security needs, come talk to me. And I'm also a founder of Tent Security. And then we have Cody. Uh, hi, I'm Cody Mafucci. Um, currently, I'm a Senior Software Security Engineer at um, Tipco Software. Um, I've a big contributor at Defect Dojo, been around the project for a little bit. Um, and then I'm also working with Matt at 10 Security as a project architect. Awesome. So I did not know this when we did the CFP, that the final frontier was going to be broken by William Shatner going up to space. So the, the connection with our talk title is completely accidental. Um, I bet it was hilarious. I was doing the deck. I was like, son of a gun, freaking <laughs> Kirk's going to space, messing things up. So what's today's talk going to be? I'm going to do a quick intro about DAST automation and just kind of cover that in general to level set things. We're going to talk about targeting in DAST. And then we're going to bring it all together with a live demo because we don't like ourselves and we like living this <laughs> uh, So today, we're going to be talking all about the intranamic to dynamic testing, um, primarily just how to do it correctly, what to watch out for, um, and things that can potentially bite you. Um, so what is DAST? Uh, it's primarily just dynamic application security testing. Um, there's really two main schools of thought. There's static testing and dynamic testing. Um, the static you can think of as just looking at the source code and trying to find anything wrong that you could potentially exploit, whereas dynamic testing is when the app is actually running and processed and you're doing all sorts of things that could potentially take advantage of browser vulnerabilities or just anything like that. Um, we're going to skip pretty much everything else um, just to really focus on DAST um, and the importance of it. So why is it hard to automate DAST? Why do I even have this talk? Um, most companies obviously don't want to test in prod, period, right? So you're stuck with the UAT or pre-prod or staging, whatever you call your not prod thing. Um, and if you're lucky that matches prod, in a lot of cases, there's some nuances to be nice between prod and not prod. So that's a problematic thing. And then you're unsure about the controls, right? Do the controls you have in prod match the controls you have in not prod? Probably not. That expensive WAF is probably only protecting prod and probably isn't protecting not prod. So you have these interesting problems. And then you also have the data. Does the data in prod match what's in not prod, right? Are you copying back, which is not exactly best practice? How are you managing that? There are all these kind of wrinkles around it. Um, companies are, it's getting much better than it used to be. I remember when like configuration management was this weird spooky thing. It's no longer weird and spooky. So the <coughs> companies are beginning to embrace Configuration management, Salt, Puppet, Chef, Helm, Ansible, all those good things. Um, and if you have containers, you're doing yourself a favor. That's much easier. Plus one, if you have any kind of elastic infrastructure where you can spin up and down things without going through a change control board or some kind of silliness. Um, you might know how I feel about change control boards after that statement. Um, and then DevOps and AppSec teams, sometimes they play nice together, sometimes they don't. That can kind of make things interesting if there isn't a good working relationship there, particularly if you want to do automated DAST with a dynamic, uh, dynamically spun up environment. If you're not friends with the DevOps peeps, you're probably not going to have that happen. Or it's going to be some pol political wrangling to make that happen. And then the other final thing that I'm kind of calling credential management, for lack of a better term, is, OK, you're not going to test in prod. You're going to test in pre-prod. Can you dynamically allocate credentials for pre-prod that are configured in a way that you need to do the accurate testing dynamically? And in almost all cases, the answer is no. And that will be a shortfall that you'll have to work around. Right? Can I grab a user in staging that has a checking account because I want to test out the bill pay portion of my banking app? Right? Well, if you don't have the ability to spin up one of those users quickly, you may be kind of running against the wind, which is not a great thing. So that's a, a wrinkle you will probably run into. So there's all sorts of different levels and levels of rigor that you can add to all sorts of your, your kind of school thought of actually doing the dynamic test itself. Um, there's two, two very big tracks, whether you do an authenticated scan or an unauthenticated scan. Um, so right off the bat, you know, the difference is, is how much of the application are you really going to be looking at? Um, so for example, on the on that side, you're going to be looking at like your login page, any kind of like FAQs, or maybe some sign up forms, some very basic stuff. 
Um, but with the authentication scan, um, it's a lot harder to actually get into. You know, actually configuring the scans to have the correct credentials and finding the right submit buttons and all that. It's it's a headache at best. Um, but it does allow you to actually get a lot more um, confidence in what you're actually finding on your web page. Um, the difference between full crawls and targeted crawls um, kind of goes back to how much of the application do you actually want to be scanning. Um, so a full crawl, obviously, is going to take a lot of extra time and a lot more resources to actually get through. But you're going to be able to know for certain, like, OK, I know where these, this is the, these are the hot spots, and this is where I'm really safe. Um, so are there anything that you, know, you want to kind of have the best of both worlds? So you could have like a full crawl, but you could also take off, you know, say, any non-important things, such as like you know, log off forms, anything that's not really all that important, like feedbacks, um, anything of that nature, really. Um, but for the more complicated things, you know, um, take for example, uh, maybe half the page only displays once you meet a certain criteria of whatever input is accepted. Um, how can you handle those things? Um, there's any additional tools that you could be using on top of something like Burp Suite to crawl. Um, you could do the automation through like Selenium browsing to just kind of programmatically walk through your web page for you, entering all sorts of different keys and strings, and open up those hidden areas that are just, well, hidden. Yeah, and, and hands up who has accidentally or not thinkingly, crawled the website with the feedback form and submitted 500 plus um, feedback forms from Peter Wiener back before Burp Suite changed the name from Peter Wiener to something mildly more appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Certainly, I've never done that. I'm much more careful, um, but I've heard of some people who have. <laughs> so let's talk about some sort of you know, more on the rigor and considerations to take. So yes, obviously, unauth is way easier. Um, it's obviously going to be less thorough, which has the upside of being quicker. But and, and politically speaking, it's much easier to sell, right? An unauth scan is something I could do from a coffee shop to any website. So you're really not adding any like more scariness to what you have just in the fact that you have the thing sitting on the internet, right? So that should be politically pretty easy to sell. Um, auth is obviously much more difficult to do right. You need kind of solid, solid password management and credential management, user management, if you want to do it in an automated fashion. It's obviously way more thorough, so it's significantly better in that regard, although you're uh, adding time to the crawls. And it's harder to sell, particularly in prod. In, in pre-prod, or if you can clone prod, that's a much better story. Um, but it is harder to sell politically. And then looking at full crawl versus targeted crawl, um, most tools know how to do a full crawl, right? You point them at a URL, you get some credits, and it goes on its merry way. Um, you kind of have to watch out for crawl loops. I've seen crawlers before, depending on how your site is developed, just you know, endlessly go through the catalog and never leave, right? And it's kind of a problematic thing. Um, the rigor is as good as the crawl, right? And if you have uh, Selenium or some kind of QA testing that's rigorous, that's a great thing to leverage to get the, uh, a well-known full crawl, so to speak. Um, and then you have to worry about the crawl time, right, on a full crawl. Like, is, it, is your site really huge? How much of your 40,000 products do you really need to crawl? Do you only, like, crawl a subset of them? Those are kind of interesting wrinkles when you get into really big sites. And then the targeted crawl, it's obviously much more difficult to set up. A lot of the crawlers aren't that smart, and particularly in the commercial automated tools. They're kind of dumb. They just like a URL and they just like to go. I've seen some of them now support Selenium and other things, which is kind of nice. But that's always kind of a wrinkle. The rigor, obviously, is only that, that target of your crawl, that limited target, but it's also nicer because if that's the spookiest part of your app and your time window is such that you can't do the full app, that may actually be a valid choice. And it's usually easier to sell because you're kind of usually focusing on the riskiest bits of the app. So Matt and I like to think of, well, this approach as kind of like a moon system. You have your three phases of the moon. You start out with nothing, and then you get the crescent and the wax, and all of a sudden you're at a full moon. That's like your peak security. You are the werewolf, essentially. Um, so when you're starting out, you're, you're doing everything by hand. You know, you're, you're just figuring out the tool. You're doing pretty much just a POC, just raw, and just going at it day after day. Um, and then once you start to kind of get it figured out and get it working at its bare bones configuration, you start thinking, OK, well, how can I make this easier? Um, and then you're still kind of in, in a hands-on approach, but you're starting to get towards a little bit towards like a halfway automated kind of way. Um, it's a lot of ways. <laughs> um, so it's really just understanding the configuration parameters and how what URLs work, which don't, which profiles work, um, blah, blah, blah. Um, and then finally, when you get to the full moon, that's when you're just passing it off and you're like, hey, this works. Put it into your workflows and magic, you know, voila, you've made it. And that's when everything is just running automatically and you just feel good as a security engineer. 
So the first phase, the crescent phase, so to speak, to use our moon analogy, right? The idea here is you're really doing a POC. I want to make sure that the tool that I'm going to pick to automate will one work and just be functional, and it produce reasonable results, right? There's no reason to automate things that's going to give you 90% false positives, like leave that thing on the floor and move on and find a better tool. So this is really the idea of the, the crescent moon phase is understanding, do I get a lot of false positives or not? Is it worth actually going forward with this tool? I'd call it a POC, right? If you pass this stage, then you go on to the second stage, the waxing moon stage. Yeah, that's just essentially like, you know, is this reproducible? Is it consistent? Am I getting the same results over and over? Um, you know, what, what tweaks in specific areas change um, in these regards? You know, are those changes really important to what, what the organization is trying to focus on? Um, really things like that. Um, it's just doing the, the very, very tedious repetitions of understanding the tool, how it speaks, how it actually presents things to you, and is, it, is half of it even usable? And what do you do with the other half that isn't? Um, yeah, and this is a, a period of time where it's really useful to spend time tweaking, particularly in commercial scanners that have like a scan profile. This is where you spend time really tweaking that, turning off signatures, turning on signatures, whatever you need to do to make it as effective as possible now that you've proved that it'll actually work. And then full moon, right? This is where you've got a profile that you can live with, you understand the scanner, it's as tuned as you can get it, you're ready to launch, right? Um, let, if you're using commercial tools, most of those and some open source as well, I believe, have scheduling options, right? You can schedule this to run weekly, daily, uh, at you know, 2 p.m. on Saturday, whatever works for you. Um, considerations on the cadence when you are doing automated scanning. You want to do it kind of clock-based every week, every day, every month, every quarter, whatever makes sense for your case. Or do you want to do it on a, like a development-based, you know, every release, every major release, every commit. Right? How quickly do you want to do this and how often do you want to do this? A lot of that will depend on how quickly you can get something from, say, a commit to a testable thing as well. If you don't have good CICD, you may not have that option. And then as, you've, um, as new versions of the tools come out, particularly in the commercial space, then there are going to be new rules and signatures and new things that you can tweak. Right? So you do have to, there is some care and feeding to this over time to make sure that your automation doesn't drift away into like a noisy mess. So one of, in my opinion, one of the most important parts of actually taking what you've made in this full moon cycle is really attaching it to, well, what, what do you want to attach it to? You really need to drill down and figure out what the scope is. You, know, you don't want to just throw this everywhere and hope it sticks and half of the places that you throw it, you want to be very deliberate with where you're deploying this, this, this automated feature. Um, so really it's considering you know, things do I want to do this on prod? Do I want to do this on like a mini prod or maybe a clone of one? Or is just doing it on, on, a, dev, on a development server good enough? Um, so those are all the things that you really need to consider before you just start throwing it everywhere and just burning that precious time. So prod versus not prod. I kind of talked about this earlier. Obviously, like I said, most businesses are super hesitant about poking at prod, right? Oh my god, it'll go down, we'll lose all the money, and it'll be awful flames and, and scariness. Um, so, you have to ask yourself, how closely does the environment you, you need to, you, or you're able to test against, I should say, match that, that uh, production environment, right? Are you confident that what you're testing is going to give you adequate results and mirror what should be or what is in prod? And this is where the testing scope is important, right? You have to understand, what have I decided to test? Like, particularly the, the first time through with your automation, getting an understanding and really having a good concrete idea of what that scope is is vitally important. Like understand what your goal is of this automation. Is it only to test the cart? Is it test the entire site? Is it only to do on auth to see what my public exposure is? Right. Determine that at first, and it'll drive a lot of these other decisions. Um, if you do have a dynamic infrastructure and you're doing configuration management correctly, talk to the DevOps team and see if they can throw up a mini prod for you. Right. Maybe your uh, prod looks like multiple load balancers with a large number of horizontal nodes behind those load balancers and maybe some services underneath those. Well, can I do a single load balancer with maybe two um, of the app nodes and a, and a single cache, right? Whatever is in your, like, can I do a mini version of prod? Can you fire that up for me in, say, one of our cloud accounts and let me have free reign to poke at that, right? Because now I can even do destructive testing because it's prod, but it's not prod, right? It's a mini clone of prod. If you can get that, you're really doing good. Um, some of this is, is political, and you may not want to die on the hill of prod. You may just have to concede that, right? It, and you may not have the DevOps chops to throw up a mini prod, and that's OK. Like, at some point, you have to sort of make the best of what the political world gives you in your job. Um, if you do have solid logging and ob observability, observ 
observability? That works. Yes, I can't speak today. <laughs> observability. This is a great way to get evidence of the safety, or could be the lack of it, in your testing of prod, right? If you have a mini prod that has the same kind of logging turned on for this mini prod, you can run a test and show, look, I ran against mini prod and nobody died. And this may be an argument to get you to prod later in the future. Um, I, I found this out in my history of doing AppSec. Not prod is usually a very neglected, redheaded stepchild of the environments. It gets very little love, so you are probably going to have to deal with inaccuracies between what is prod and what you're actually testing. And then understand with the scope in particular what you're trying to test. Are you testing, if you're a microservice app, are you testing the one microservice or are you testing that microservice in with all the other microservices? Like, what's the scope? Right? And then the scope will tell you that and that'll let you know maybe if it is just a single microservice is the scope of your test, that's really easy to throw up as a mini prod. I literally just have to maybe launch a container and then poke at it, right? So that may be an easy win, just another consideration. Yeah, really, really echoing on, on the whole non-prod, prod argument, um, it's really important to consider how, how these non-prod and prod uh, environments are really set up. You know, so we, Matt and I like to think of this as static and dynamic. Um, so a static environment for, for prod and non-prod is, well, as an example of the redheaded stepchild. You just have your non-prod just sitting there. It's got very minimal data. It's really not that useful besides you can just hit it in a browser. Um, but then your prod environment's got all sorts of moving parts. You know, people are still using it all the time. Um, you know, which, which one are you going to prefer when you're doing your testing? Obviously, the one that has a bigger use case and can do some really more tangible reporting. Um, so it really just depends on, on where your organization is on their whole, we call it the, um, what was our term? The automation journey. Um, so <laughs> we're big fans of, of automating configurations through what we call configuration management using something like Anz Ansible, Puppet, Salt, um, anything like that to where if you could just spin up something that's as, as close to the production server as possible, the better. That's kind of our ideal situation to where you know, it's kind of like a copy paste. That's perfect. Um, but you know, at, at a lot of works, you don't really find that very often. You just find, well, you have a prod and you have a not prod. Not prod is just hanging out. Um, so the quality of, res of your results really depends on what kind of groundwork you put in place for provisioning these new servers um, against the prod and the non-prod. And then losing control, a little bit of a, a, a clickbaity uh, slide title. It's not really about losing control, but you have to determine what you want to do about those intermediate controls that aren't necessarily in the app, right? You're testing an app, let's say that's your scope. Well, if you have a WAF and an IPS and a bunch of other intermediary devices between public internet and that app, is that in scope or not? Right? Are you wanting to test the app in isolation, meaning I want to test the app with no external controls? Or, and I want to understand how the app would perform by itself, because maybe the controls fail open and the app is now on the internet without the WAF. Do I want to understand what that looks like? That may be like a consideration for your scope. And it would give you the, uh, value, or the ability to evaluate what that app can do kind of in and of itself. Like how sturdy is it without these external controls? Or others, are those external controls like fundamental in keeping that app alive on the internet? Or you could test the app in what I would call its native environment, right? I want to test it with all the normal inline controls that I have, WAFs and whatnot, to understand how effective those are as providing extra belt and suspender protection to my app. Right? That may be your scope as well. Um, it's kind of nice because you get to understand the security posture of that app in production, presuming, this is a big presuming and a big if, the non-prod thing that you're probably testing has the same controls as prod. That's a big if, so watch out for that. Um, and you do get to at least evaluate the effectiveness of those controls, right? If this, particularly if you do the hybrid option, which is the last option where you do both, if I can get a SQL injection without the WAF in place, but I don't get it with the WAF in place, well, the WAF is actually providing some value. That's kind of cool. I just figured that out. Now, I have to do two scans to do that. That's kind of painful. Um, there's a lot of setup there, but it is kind of nice to get that full picture. And that's one of those decisions you're going to have to decide, do I want or not want to evaluate those controls as part of my system. Yeah, just to add on to that, there's another level of scope, uh, surprise. <laughs> um, you know, different audiences want different things. Um, so if you're wanting to work with developers, you may not want to just give them an entire report encompassing the entire application because you know, for, for most organizations, you've got like an API team, a web dev team, maybe a, a mobile app team. The mobile app team does not care anything about the other two. Um, so in some cases, you might want to have your, your testing split off and do everything kind of individually so you can give the reports to the people that can actually do the triaging. 
Um, but in the case of auditors, they want to see the big picture. You know, if you just give them one piece of the puzzle, they're going to be like, well, what, what do you want me to do with this? You know, do you want to pass or not? Um, so it's, you know, it's kind of where, where do you want to put your eggs? You know, who's, do you want to put all the work on the security team to put all these testing in place? Or do you want to just pass the dev team one massive report and have them kind of comb through it and figure out their, their own piece of the, the mission? Um, so that's another big thing to consider when you're setting up this automation. And then, if you haven't figured it out by now, I like configuration management, right? This is where if you don't have it, or if you don't know if you have it, go find out like as quickly as possible, because that's really going to radically change. Or gossip, if you're interviewing for a new job, ask that question before you get there, because it'll tell you what kind of environment you're dropping into. Kind of a good thing to know. Like, is my uh, testing and automating my testing going to be more or less interesting, meaning painful? Um, but find that out. That's really, really important, because if you have that, and you can make friends with the people that control that part of the business, you can really get way more mileage for your time, which is a big, big thing. Spinning up those consistent environments is huge. Um, one of the nice things, we did this a lot at Rackspace, and one of the cool things that came out of that is we actually had what I, we call blessed versions. So our Ansible was checked into, I think we had an internal GitHub, whatever the repository was. It was checked into the repository, we would give it a tag and tell the ops teams, you can do 17500, I don't care, releases, out to prod of this tagged version because we've looked at it and it's hardened and it's going to be consistently deployed. Knock yourself out, guys. We don't care. All right. So that's another advantage you can get with this um, uh, configuration management doing things right. And if you do have your configuration management parameterized, that's how you can take the same, in essence, uh, configuration management setup that does a big prod and make a little prod just by changing some parameters and off you go. Yeah, uh, kind of a, a different branch of the configuration. Um, you know, everybody loves Docker containers. I'm the biggest fan of Docker ever. I love it. Um, use it every single day, actually. Um, but the, the big thing is, is that you can pretty much create a container and just pass it off to anybody, and they can just run it locally. And it ideally shouldn't be changeable. You know, they, they don't have to go talk to IT, get some service provisioned, run the whole config management, get everything loaded, wait you know, two to three business days. Um, we all know how that grind is. Um, with Docker containers, it's it's instantaneous for the most part. You know, you pull down the image. You know, I can do it. The devs can do it. Even the CISO can do it. Everybody can do it, and it's really fantastic. Um, but the best part is, is that it's scalable as well. You know, it, Docker is kind of a little base level um, when you're getting into it, but then you can kind of graduate onto the K8s, and then you could do all sorts of nutty things with K8s. Um, so you could be having all this automation on either locally or in the in the web, in the cloud, wherever you fancy for the most part. Um, but yeah, go containers. And if you do get to the point where you're very mature with containers, one of the nice things you can do as well is, let's say you set up that these four tests are going to be automated and happen any time you go to pre-prod. You can give those same containers with the same configurations to the devs and say, hey, before you push to uh, the repo, why don't you run this locally, right? All they need is Docker on their box and they're off to the races. That's a great way to say, hey, I can give you a chance to pre-check that you're going to pass the call that you're going to get when you try to you know, commit to master or whatever your trigger is to run those tests. Yes, who doesn't love delegation, right? Yeah. Um, so bring it all together. You know, we've talked about a whole lot of different things and ways that you can really go about it. Um, so we've made a little demo for you. Um, yeah, so uh, un esempio. I, I didn't want to We both it. have Italian backgrounds, <laughs> although we don't speak it. And, and um, 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 well, I'm far removed from Italy anyway. But I, there's my grandfather's father came from Italy, so it's kind of close. <laughs> um, anyway, I thought I'd put a little bit of Italian in here since we both have Italian backgrounds. So the idea here is, here's the background. Here's the setup. You work at a company. You want to start doing DAS automation. You've decided to start with on-off scans. It's easy. It's politically sellable. Um, you decide to containerize your tools in the targets because you like containers or you're me doing the demo and that's just what makes sense to you. Um, well, actually, Cody did the demo, so props to him. Um, you run dynamic parallel deploys of the application in testing, so I have the ability to spin up these mini prods in essence. We're going to pick two tools just to make life easy for our first iteration. So we're going to do TLS testing as well as a DAS scanner. And then all the scans are going to go into our vulnerability repository, which is there any choice? It's Defect Dojo. Come on, be real. I, I may or may not happen to be a core contributor, <laughs> but yeah, it's a great, a great project. So now it's time to uh, do something or get off the proverbial pot. I ran into this image of an astronaut on a toilet, and I couldn't not include it in my astro-themed deck. So sorry. That is the, the maybe that's the new file frontier. Yeah, I think that might be William Shatner, actually. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. 
Okay, let's go to the demo <laughs> before I get myself in trouble. Uh, here we go. So, so while Matt's pulling that up, um, give you kind of a, a high level, uh, I guess, look through the glass on yeah. what this demo is. Um, <laughs> It, it's pretty it's pretty quick actually um, so it's all just based on docker compose which is just kind of a way to organize a whole bunch of docker containers kind of talk to each other. it's kind of like a click um, but it takes about I don't know a minute or so um, it's pretty quick it's pretty quick um, the longest part is just waiting for our zap scan to go through um, so that I don't know if we really touched on that too much but one thing that you really need to consider when when setting up all this automation is how long does scanning take um, you know, in, in some cases, uh, do you want to rush things and just get it in? Then maybe you want to pick, you know, either faster scanners or leave out some of the other ones that are a little too slow. Um, it's really up to you and what the organization needs. Um, so, so full disclosure, we have a, an existing running container with Defect Dojo as well as Juice Shop. Juice Shop will be our target because, hey, we're all OWASP friendly here. <laughs> I'm going to pull this over here and hope it's readable. Uh, it's not. Give me a second. Oops. There we go, make this smaller. Oh, that's not how to do it. I forget how to visit this one. There we go. That, hopefully this is generally readable. Okay, here we go. So, I don't like typing. There's a beautiful thing called demo magic that types for you. All I have to do is hit enter. So here we go. This is me typing, really, I swear, not really. So let's get the demo. Wish us luck. Just like in the movies. Right? Yeah, just like in the movies. <laughs> so first, let's set up the prerequisites, which I've done already and I showed you. We've got Dojo and Dushop. That's our Docker Compose to fire those up. OK, let's go show people. This is to remind me to show you that, which I already did, so I don't need to remind me. Efficient. Yeah, I'm efficient. So let's run the tests against those targets. Off we go. We've just launched that SSLIs and Zap container. We're waiting for the Zap to complete. It takes yeah. That's, I think six, 60 seconds. 60 seconds. We were testing on the hotel Wi-Fi last night, so you know mileage may vary. Although conference yeah. Wi-Fi and hotel Wi-Fi compete for being the most interesting. Yeah. Um, but in, what we're doing basically is sparking up a SSLIs. Uh, container pointing it at the target, sparking up a zap container pointing at the target, running the tests, writing them to a shared volume um, that then will later read in and push those results to um, defect data. Yeah. yeah. So how about those Mets? <laughs> no, wait, the Astros. We can talk about that, the Astros. How about those Astros? Did they win last night? I didn't see. Oh, they didn't know oh, happy yeah. faces. You. Good, good, good. This is how you vamp when you're waiting for demos to finish. Right. Was that second game or third game? That was second. second? Okay, one to one then. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, we're doing something. Cool. This cool. won't cool. age well though. Sorry, people watching this on YouTube. <laughs> Thank you very much. You'll right. know if we're happy. So, oh, here we go. Yay, you got past it. So now we're importing the results into Defect Dojo. I'm removing those two containers that we're running and um, not killing the network because the same network is where our Defect Dojo is running at. Let me yep. jump over here. Here's our Defect Dojo. Oops, if I hit refresh. There we go. Yay, we've got an active engagement. If I go look at uh, products, you will see we now have the Juice Shop project created. It wasn't there before. I can drill into the Juice Shop project and look at the engagements. Here is our engagement we just did. And SSLIs, this is running on localhost, so there's nothing for SSLIs. For Zap, we have six results. And here's our Zap test, and we can drill into there. Wait, where am I clicking? It's so hard to click over your shoulder. <laughs> uh, oh, here we go. There they are. Dang it. Small up screen resolution. Hit me. So here's our results, right? So we've run in a minute. Two different tools against a particular API, or a particular app, excuse me, and push those results where they needed to go into. Hey, you come up here. Nope, hold on one second. Dang it. Windows are tough. Windows are tough in a uh, presentation. Did we get it? Yes. Hey, there we are. There we go. Uh, so this is kind of just like an infographic on what we were talking about. Um, just have Docker spin up your 
your man uh, vulnerability management software, aka Defect Dojo, and then whatever your application is, hopefully it's better than Juice, Juice Shop. Um, after that, you're just doing all sorts of testing. It, it hopefully includes more than just Zap and SSLIs. Um, and the way I set it up was I just kind of had those reports and jumbled them into a shared volume. Um, and then on the next slide, you jump into another third-party container that actually reads those, the volumes and takes those reports and shows them in the Defect Dojo. Um, so one thing in the demo that you might have noticed was there were two Zaps and two SSLIs. Um, whenever we ran this this morning, we didn't clear out the volume. So we, we just kind of imported the same report twice um, from this morning and one live in the demo. Um, mileage may vary. Yeah. Just, just in case. In case. Can it, two never hurts, right? You can never have a little minor demo fail. Right. <laughs> That's what, that's, what, that's what shows you're running a demo. <laughs> exactly. Um, as always, it's very important to clean up all of your dirty work. Uh, we didn't hear today because, well, the project was run in tandem with Juice Shop. But generally speaking, you want to get rid of all the evidence because you don't want to be keeping around those reports too long. Um, well, the raw reports anyways, you may want to generate some formalized reports that you want to pass to the dev team or auditors or whoever, whoever we may require them. And, and your cloud provider is happy to bill you for those things you forget to turn off. That too. <laughs> if no other reason. So key takeaways, um, understand and be clear about your scope. I've said that a couple of times, I'm reiterating it now. You can always expand that later. So I would say don't be too aggressive if you're just launching this for the first time, kind of you know, pick your battles wisely. I would start small and look for some easy wins to get some confidence. And it kind of depends on what your sort of goodwill is with the rest of your company. Right? If you're established and they trust you, you may not have some uh, uphill work, but if you're a brand new drop into an AppSec program, you may have to do a little bit of politicking to make that happen. And then think carefully about your, your scanner choice, right? Do you want a sort of custom focus test versus general and ad hoc, right? Do you want something that's only like testing your Ruby shop so you have a Rails test? Or do you just want a web app test to test generally, generically web? Um, and, and are they general or are they ad hoc? Do you want to be able to uh, fire these off, say, per release or for a very quick cadence versus a, like a weekly or some kind of a calendar cadence? Um, open source scanners, by the way, they fly under the budget radar. So if you want to start with open source scanners, it's probably not a bad thing to do. There's no approval for purchasing or budget to happen. So I kind of like those when I'm starting out these kind of programs, even though they may not be a perfect choice. In all cases, it's really nice to be able to prove it without spending money. Um, and then you can ask for money with some proof that it actually works. Um, commercial considerations, how automation friendly is that tool? Uh, this was several years ago where I tried to automate a commercial SAS scanner. When we talk to them, they're like, oh, we have an API. We have an API. I'm like, awesome, great. I learned not to trust that answer because their API was a binary that I had to run locally. That is not an API that is a freaking client. Oh, so I had to write Python around that client to actually make calls to do automation. It was ugly. It was hacky code. It worked. But so find out how automation friendly it is. Ask for the API doc so you can make sure the API actually provides those functions you need. That's another place where I've been bit in the past. And find out how sane and useful that API is. Right? Does it just tell you that a scan was completed and nothing else, or can I actually edit profiles with that API? Right? How robust is that? They're getting way better. They used to be quite terrible. You want to know how configurable that tool is if you want to do a targeted versus a, a general crawl. Those kind of things are very important. And what kind of crawl, if, does that tool have the kind of crawl that you need, or do you need to supplement it with something like a browser driver, uh, Selenium, or those kind of things? And then target selection, right? This is where you determine where to test. Um, if you're lucky, you have an on-demand environment, right? You may have to deal with a static environment. You honestly probably are going to have to deal with a static environment in most cases. And that's OK. You just need to know that up front. If you have containers, right, this is great. If you have, particularly if you have containers and cloud, spinning those things up is OK as long as you can get access to your own little chunk of your cloud account. Um, and then don't forget to tear those down, because like I said, cloud providers love to bill you for resources you didn't kill for some odd reason. And then connecting with CI, CD, consider the cadence, right? This is always an interesting problem where you have to kind of balance how long the test takes versus how frequently I'm getting triggered to do an, an assessment, right? If your dev teams are moving really fast and you're trying to do a per, let's say, uh, commit to master, and those are happening three or four times a day, and your test takes eight hours to do a full crawl, that's a problem, right? You need to figure that out. Now, one of the ways I've handled that is to have a non-breaking test that gets fired on the first commit to master. It runs for eight hours, and maybe two or three more commits happen, and I just have a way to tell, hey, that, that thing is still running. Just skip this test for now. And yes, I don't break the build on that, that run, but I do get results at the end. 
which is really kind of more important because if you're going to break the build, it better be bloody real or you're going to get booted out of CI CD quicker than you can say something really short. Um, and then long running tests. You do have to make sure they don't wrap on themselves. I've made this mistake where I launch a test and then I launch a test and I have like six tests going because a bunch of events happened all in a row and I wasn't smart and checked to make sure there wasn't a, one concurrently running. So just a, that's a great way to sort of uh, shoot yourself in the foot if you're not careful with this automation. And that's it. We've reached the end of our fun and exciting journey. So I'm Matt Tassar. That's how to get a hold of me. And he's Cody. Yeah, it's Mafuchi. I spell it wrong half the time, so no, no worries two if you mispronounce it. Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's the only me. way I remember it. But uh, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. Like uh, feeding the reports to like uh, like a backlog, and then using like tags to separate the auto teams that you were talking about. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. that's it. I'm just repeating it in case the mic didn't pick it up. Uh, he was asking why we didn't cover the aspect of taking the results and pushing them off to say specific backlogs for teams. Um, tagging them or some such thing to make that happen. And I would completely recommend that I was trying to not make this talk take longer to be what with you, but I absolutely agree. Like after you get these results done, feeding them into the place where your developers expect to see them is exceedingly important. I cannot emphasize how important that is because like shoving a, a I mean, uh, nobody likes getting the 500 page PDF of, of crap. Like uh, as a developer, I know how to deal with issues in JIRA. Right? As a developer, I do not want to get an email with a big fat PDF that I have to deal with. Like, ugh. Yeah. yeah. So totally, absolutely. Especially if you're asking about like a release block or two, like last second. Do what I didn't catch that. And especially if they're if that PDF report is like a potentially oh in for conversation to be a release blocker. Yeah, that big report yeah. blocking a release is how you get booted out of um, things, and then shadow IT happens around you because we can't tell the security guy because he's going to shaft us again. Yeah. No, totally, totally avoid that. <laughs> yeah. Make friends and be nice. Any other questions? Going once, going twice? Well, thank you. Come get All a right. shirt if you want. Yeah. I have extra shirts. Got shirts, oh, straws, hand sanitizer. Got you.